Hi Brent here and welcome to part 2 of my X58 PC build series. In this video I'll be going over some of the hardware upgrades that I've added to the X58 system since part 1. We'll be getting into some overclocking and then we'll be going over some of the benchmarking results and looking at the performance improvements gained as a result of doing so. Now it's been about 6 months since I released part 1 and the main delay between videos has been the hesitancy to invest in a graphics card. I wanted to ride out the wave of Nvidia's RTX 20 series launch and now that that wave seems to have just passed I've finally bit the bullet and invested in a graphics card. So the graphics card that I've gone with is the MSI Gaming X 8GB RX 580 which I managed to get delivered for just under $250. Now for that price it was second hand, however it did include the original packaging and instruction manuals and was only purchased at the beginning of the year, so it still holds over two years out of its three year warranty. And with the whole purpose of this build being per dollar performance, I believe that the RX 580 will fit that perfectly. And as an added bonus, the monitor that I utilise has free sync capabilities, so I'll be able to pair the two together nicely. In addition to the purchase of a new graphics card, I've also purchased four new components since part one, with the first new component being a PCIe to USB 3.0 expansion card for $12. Now it's a no-name card that I bought in order to enable the two USB 3.0 ports on the front of the Cougar case, as the X58 motherboard that I have does not have any USB 3 headers. Now the second new component is an Edimax 1200AC dual band Wi-Fi PCIe card that I purchased at $49. Now it's capable of running at 300 megabits per second on the 2.4 gigahertz band and up to 867 megabits per second on the 5 gigahertz wavelength. So next I have a 2 terabyte 7200 RPM Seagate Barracuda hard drive that I picked up for $78 and that'll be looking after all of my storage requirements. So the 750 gig hard drive that I showcased in the previous video didn't quite cut the corners on my needs so I'll be adding this 2 terabyte in addition to the 750 so I'll have 2.75 terabytes total. And last of all I have three 120mm Cooler Master RGB Master Fan Pros to help cool my overclock system, which I managed to pick up second hand for just $35. So as I mentioned earlier, it has been quite a few months since I released part 1 to this PC build series, and I have been utilising the PC during this time. So as a result there has been some dust build up on the fan filters. So before getting into overclocking, I've cleaned out the fan filters, along with reapplying some thermal compound to the Northbridge heatsink. Now this was well and truly needed as I believe the original thermal compound was still applied and needed quite some encouragement to remove. So now that that's all sorted, let's get into some overclocking. Alright, so here we are, we've booted up into the BIOS home screen and we're going to dive into some overclocking. Now I've obtained these values that I'll be entering from doing some research on the internet for people with similar systems and then optimizing and tweaking the settings just a little bit to work best with my CPU and motherboard combo. So first of all we're going to jump into the MB Intelligent Tweaker. So from here we'll be able to change some of our frequencies, voltages, along with other advanced options to give us the overclock that we desire. So first of all if we jump into advanced frequency settings, we need to ensure that the clock's been set to 23. So the 23 multiplier is what's perfect for the X5675. Depending on what CPU you have, you might have a multiplier of 22, 21, 24, whatever it may be, but for, for the X5675 it's 23. So we'll make sure that we've got 23 entered into there. Now we'll jump into the advanced CPU core features. So in the advanced CPU core features, we're actually going to disable turbo boost. Because we'll be applying this overclock, we actually want it to be stable at the overclock and not have the turbo boost ride it like a roller coaster and improve voltage and then demote voltage when, uh, when it feels like it. So we'll turn that feature off. We want all of our CPU cores enabled along with multi-threading. The en enhanced halt feature for C1E we will enable and we will leave the C367 states disabled. The thermal monitor we will keep enabled which will remove or lower voltages um, if it ever detects that our CPU is overheating. Um, and same with CPU ESIT, EIST function, pardon me, which will actually lower voltages and clocks when the CPU isn't being used. So if it's on an idle state, it won't be pumping through the max voltage. It'll actually reduce it to a state where it's able to idle and, and therefore be better on power. Uh, and of course, last of all, bidirectional, we will put on enabled. So back out into our clocks, we're going to go to the QPI clock ratio and we'll put that on the lowest option for X36. 
And then the uncore clock ratio, I have tested this and X16 seems to work the best for my setup and um, settings. So the base clock control we are going to enable. And for the base clock, I have found the most stable and what I'm most comfortable at running at a 24-7 at a usage is 194. So 194 times the multiplier of 23 will give our CPU a 4.4 gigahertz clock. So the X5675, its base clock is just over 3 gigahertz and the turbo is about 3.33. So we're getting roughly about an additional third of, of performance here. So down to the system memory multiplier, which is our uh, RAM frequency. So the stock RAM frequency for what I have is 1333. But with the additional clock speeds here for the for the base clock and the memory frequency multiplier, uh, we'll be getting 1552 megahertz. And the PCIe express frequency, last of all, we will be setting to 100, which is the default. So as you can see on the right hand side here, um, PCI devices are not guaranteed to operate normally if frequency is higher than 100, so we'll just keep it at 100. Uh, the rest of the settings here we will leave untouched. So under advanced memory settings, um, we're going to leave the multiplier at 8, which is what we've just set it to on the previous page. The performance enhance, we're going to actually set back to standard. So if I have that on turbo, uh, the DRAM wants to, to push up higher. Um, which we don't want um, as it's stable um, at 15, 1500 MHz. So onto DRAM timing, we will leave, sorry, not leave, we're going to change that to quick. And we won't change any of the timings. I'm happy with the timings that are set there. Um, now over into advanced voltage, we're going to change our CPU core to, unfortunately we're going to have to scroll down here, our CPU core we're going to set to 1.387 volts. So I'll just wait till we scroll up here. Now if I was pushing for a higher higher clock, say 4.5 or maybe even 4, 4.55, 4.6, um, I would most likely need to increase the voltage there of the uh, of the CPU V cores. It would be demanding more power uh, to run at those frequencies. Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, 4.45 or 4.46. Um, technically is what it is. Um, I'm more than happy uh, with that to run 24-7. So if it was something that I was, you know, just wanting to do briefly to try and really squeeze every last bit of juice out of the CPU and, and see what the absolute maximum uh, was, I would go for that. But yeah, like I said, 24-hour usage will stick there. Uh, so the QPI, QPI voltage, pardon me, we're going to go to 1.295. And for the CPU PLL, we'll go to 1.88. Excellent. So we'll leave all these at auto, and the last thing that I'm going to change is the DRAM voltage. We're going to switch that up to 1.6. So there we go. That's all the settings we want to change. So I'm just going to click F10 or press F10 here, pardon me, to save those settings to the CMOS. So the PC here is going to fully power off while it applies those settings. Okay, so here we are. We can see that we've booted up into Windows without any issues, and we're now running the IDA64 stress test just to ensure that our CPU overclock is stable and we're not going to encounter any unexpected blue screens or system failures um, throughout any daily tasks on the PC. So as you can see here on the CPU, our maximum temperature that we've hit is 64 degrees, which is well within the uh, safe temperature working zone, so very pleased with that. I believe it's only 5 degrees hotter than what the optimised defaults um, were running at, so very happy there, and our water cooler is definitely doing its job. Uh, now if you look a bit further down on the voltages uh, for the CPU core, you can see that it's hit a maximum of 1.36 at one stage, however it does seem to be floating right around the 1.33 um, voltage there, and when, as you remember just earlier, we put a maximum of 1.38 in the BIOS, so just in case the CPU does decide to spike at any given time, it will have that headroom to go there, and then be able to level itself out and stabilise itself without having a system halt. Now you can see also that our uh, benchmark here has been running, or our stress test, pardon me, has been running for well over 40 minutes, so I'm very pleased to say that this is a stable overclock. So with that being stable, let's move over to our RX 580 and see what we can do with our graphics card. Okay, so let's get into overclocking our MSI Gaming X 8GB RX 580. 
And to do so, I'm going to be using the application called MSI Afterburner, which is a great tool for overclocking graphics cards. Now, mine is actually an MSI branded card, but if I had a Gigabyte, an NVIDIA, um, any other branded graphics card, I would also be using this tool as it's quite versatile and very easy to use. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the application here. Now by default, this core voltage slider will not be enabled. So you will need to go into settings here and unlock the voltage control and monitoring. And in addition to that, I've also enabled the unified GPU usage monitoring. So after doing so, I'm going to go ahead and punch in my overclock, which I already know ahead of time is stable. So I'm going to put in a core voltage of 50 plus the power limit I'm going to max out there the temp limit you can also see is maxed out the core clock I'm going to bump from 1380 megahertz to 1450 and then the memory megahertz I'm going to bump from 2000 to 2200 and the fan speed I'm going to take off auto and I'm actually going to manually put that in at 73 um, now 73 weird number it's just what I slid the uh, the rail to at the time I was doing the testing and it seems to work fine so I'm going to go ahead and apply that setting so after doing that I can hear I'm not sure if you can pick it up on the mic but the fans of the graphics card there have obviously ramped up and I'm going to run Combustor. So Combustor is a graphics card stress test. Uh, now that'll put the this, uh, this part of me, the GPU at max load and run through there. I normally suggest having this open for about 30 minutes or so, uh, longer if you have the time. And if you do see any sort of funny artifacts or the application closes, then I would suggest that your overclock um, is not suited for your GPU. Um, however, like I said, I have tested this prior and I know that it is stable, so I'm happy with that. Righto, so there we are. Both our CPU and GPU overclocks are now locked in and ready to go. So we'll move over to benchmarking now and take a look at how the system fares in modern gaming titles and productivity tasks. Also, just as a quick side note, the numbers you're about to see are a mean average of five runs, so as to help negate and minimise any margins of error. Enjoy.
So there you have it. I think with those benchmarking numbers, it's safe to say that both the X5675 and Gigabyte X58 motherboard that I have here, released in 2010, are more than capable of running modern gaming titles and still able to hold their own when it comes to current productivity workloads. So as a quick recap on the total costs of the end build, I managed to pick up both X58 systems as showcased in part 1 for 530 Australian dollars and sold all of the unneeded components for a further $230, which brings the total costs for the CPU, motherboard, 12GB kit of RAM, 750GB hard drive and DVD drive to $300 even. The new components did add quite a significant cost to the total tally of the build, coming in at $806, therefore making the complete total cost of the build $1,106. Now I do intend on holding on to all of the new components for the foreseeable future, and also have the added benefit of having a manufacturer's warranty for all components under the Australian Consumer Law, something that I can't take for granted with the X58 components, as if something was to go wrong with them, I would have to unfortunately throw them in the scrapyard and obtain a new component. So when it comes down to the punch, would I recommend an X58 system for somebody looking to purchase a second-hand build? And the answer is, it depends. If you would have asked me just over a year ago, I would have said yes without a moment's hesitation. However, with AMD recently releasing their Ryzen platform, which offers a decent amount of multi-threaded cores and good clock speeds for an excellent price, forcing Intel to also overhaul their entire consumer lineup, X58 has moved down a couple of pegs and isn't quite the bargain it once was. However, if you are looking to buy something now and can't wait for Ryzen and Intel 8th and 9th gen uh, components to come on the market, I would say if you can pick an X58 system for a reasonable price, go for it. So with all that said and done, let's take a look at the final build. So there you have it, thanks for watching and until the next one, bye for now.